So welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist podcast and very excited to have my guest today because for those that have ever had a conversation with me outside of just listening through the Compassionate Capitalist show, you know, one of the areas that I have um, struggled with early on when I was first rebuilding the Angel Investor Group was the choice between making a, a, a minor investment, like a minor's holding of a, of a company, an investment in a company that helped propel that company forward, but also do you outright buy a business and run it or ha- hire people to run it and have all the systems of a franchise. So it's your one-off individual you know, type of business that may or may not have potential to scale based off of franchising or licensing. And then there's the one where you just buy. I remember one of my very first conversations when I was trying to help this company raise money and we had an investor that was really, really key, was wanting to do this thing. His financial planner had brought him to the table and he ended up, we were almost done. You know, we think it's gonna go forward and he chooses to take his 150 grand or whatever he was going to invest and buy a franchise. His wife had convinced him that he needed to buy a franchise. And I was like, well, and then I started reading Robert Kiyosaki's stuff on franchising and why that's such a good business investment wealth creation strategy. And the purpose of the Compassionate Capitalist Show is to fund um, entrepreneur development and growth and create wealth as the investor or the entrepreneur and franchising falls square smack in the middle of that. And my guest today, Kim Daly, is guess what? She's America's top franchise consultant and she has helped thousands of entrepreneurs and investors explore franchise opportunities. Prior to becoming a franchise consultant, Kim ran a health and fitness consulting firm working with the titans of industry. Kim graduated summa cum laude with a degree in nutritional biochemistry and a minor in sports nutrition. She spent 20 years helping people achieve financial freedom by enabling them to find the perfect franchise opportunities. Today, we will dig into her knowledge and insights about franchising as a wealth creation strategy. And whether you are an active investor seeking to own and operate your own franchise or an entrepreneur seeking to scale through franchising or a passive investor seeking to own a predictable business model by investing in franchise concepts, we're going to give you some gold nuggets for that today. So welcome, Kim. Thanks Thank you. On. What an amazing introduction. Thanks, Karen. That was really nice. <laughs> when you start talking about college, I'm like, that was like, so it's so funny, right? It's like so many years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, well, we all start somewhere and that's, well, that's really what I wanted to like getting into the topic, you know, uh, we're our, our subject matter, franchising a pathway to wealth. How did you go from consulting and health and fitness and working with the likes of Dr. Dennis Waitley and ediets.com and even Gold's Gym to being in a, a franchise consultant? Yeah, it's not an obvious uh, path I took, right? It was, it all ended up exactly where I wanted it to go, but I, uh, there were many turns along the road where I thought I didn't know where I was going, but it was, it was all good. So I started out nutritional biochemistry on my way to med school. I actually answered a classified ad in the newspaper, which I have to stop and explain what that is to some people based on how old they are. <laughs> and, uh, and it changed my life. It was for a franchise consulting company, not the company I'm with now. But I spent three years right out of college. I never went to med school. Um, I got into this entrepreneurial world. I loved it. People helping people. It was so motivating and inspiring and changing people's lives. And I just absolutely fell in love from day one of working for that franchise consulting company. But the entrepreneur in me was really born during that time. So I left that company at the ripe old age of 25. I, um, I've been self-employed since I was 25 and I just turned 49 last week. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, for five years, I started my own company and I ran that company and actually it was multiple spinoffs from one brand um, and from one parent organization. And it was fun and it was entrepreneurial and um, it was kind of flying by the seat of my pants and making it up and traveling a lot and Every day was a new adventure and I was successful from day one, but there were no systems to what I was doing. There was no rhythm. I couldn't find the rhythm to what I was doing or like, who did I really want to be when I grew up? So at the wrong old age of 29, I <laughs> turned back to my franchising roots. And that's when Fran Choice, the franchise that I'm a part of, the company I'm a part of, was getting started. 
And I thought, well, gee, that's sort of like being a franchise consultant sounds a lot like being a personal trainer, right? It's coaching people through a process that changes their life. Only we're going to be talking about business, which I, I just learned the ins and outs and ups and downs of and struggles and, you know, the highs and lows of being a business owner for five years. And I thought, I'm going to give that a try. I mean, I had no idea when I said yes to franchise in um, 2002 that it would take me on the journey that it's take me on, taken me on. But I, I, I was born for this opportunity. I love this, this uh, business I'm in. I get to wake up and help people change their lives every single day. That's really rewarding. I mean, that's uh, to, you know, I think one of the secrets of, uh, I guess, happiness or contentment is, is doing what you love and actually making money doing it. So, you know, it's there so you go. true. Yeah. It's, and then, you know what, Karen, I, every day I meet people who sadly, you know, they'll say things like, I want what you have Kim, you know, I'm like, well, what is it that you think I have? <laughs> this is that I'm happy that I'm relaxed, that I live a life that I'm in control of. They feel my freedom, you know, and I've, I've told people for years, I'm completely unemployable, not because, well, my dad would say, Kimberly, you've been unemployable since you were two years old, you've always been the boss of you. but, but, um, and not because I, someone couldn't afford me necessarily, maybe that too at this point, but more because my freedom has no price. Like I learned very young that if I could figure out how to do it for myself, I was going to be the boss and control my, my future. And I've just never turned back. And that's in fact, what I'm selling. Franchising is just the vehicle that people are choosing because it, you can leverage somebody else's learning curve. But every single day I meet people that are like, I've you know, worked for 20 years. I didn't like my job or I'm in this business and I don't like the people. I don't like the culture. I feel like I, you know, I can't control my life. I have no work-life balance. I'm, there's a glass ceiling. I can't bust through all of those kind of things. And I get to help them just like break free from all of that. And even if they're going to keep that job and become a semi-absentee owner, create a path where they can see an exit strategy. And that alone is like the rainbow in, you know, yeah. in the clouded sky. So that's, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that's one of the big pluses of franchises is the fact that you can, there's such a wide variety whether it's something that you see as a up and coming industry that's sort of breaking through and new types of solutions or something that you just know is never going to go away because people are always going to need that type of a service or product. And uh, just the, the range, location, there's just such a variety that you can find a good match. And it's great that there's an organization such as yours that really helps people, you know, figure that out and get connected up. So, Let's just start by painting a, a broad stroke, stroke of the industry and talk about like what I just said, the whole range of it, because I give people like how many of them are somebody started their own franchise versus somebody like, uh, uh, you know, a big conglomerate that owns multiple franchises in there that they sell those franchisees for like raging brands that has you know, all these different types of food establishments, you know, they were sort of like the leader of the, it wasn't fast food. It was like quick serve or something like that. Right. And so, so talk, just give us a broad stroke of, of what people could think about that, that would blow their minds as to, oh, I had no idea there were franchises that did that kind of thing. Well, right? that's my sweet spot, really. <laughs> so for 19 years, um, I've helped people get into businesses. So my sweet spot really are, I mean, I, I, I work with all kinds of franchises. There are over two or 3000 businesses out there that are franchises for sale at any one time. That's the number you can, you, I hear tossed around the industry, you know, entrepreneur magazine ranks the top 500 franchises every year. So we know at least there are 500, but there's many, many more beyond that, that don't make the list. Um, and there are businesses that are small companies, like a husband and wife team had a great idea, turned it into a franchise, and now they're franchising it. And then there are big corporations like Regis, which is a billion dollar company, and they own Supercuts and Cost Cutters and all the Regis hair salons. And so, and, and my job as a franchise consultant is to help people figure out really what the right investment is for them. And it's not our conversations are not about widgets. I don't really care about whether the business is cutting hair or grooming dogs or changing oil. 
I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It matters so much as the the product or the service aligns with you morally and ethically and that it's something that you see the need for, that you see the opportunity to be in. But I don't need widget experts or masters, right? Uh, Franchisors need people with good business skills. We can teach you about the widget, but we can't teach you how to be the best boss that your employees ever had. We can't teach you to love getting up and prospecting and cold calling and, and building a pipeline and driving activity. So when you come with your basic business skills and, um, and an open mind, then we can cast a really wide net, you and I, around the types of businesses that might fit you. So I'm more focused on your risk tolerance. Do you want to be in that new up and coming brand where you get to be a pioneer being with the first to market advantage, which I might argue is one of the the biggest advantages you can have in a franchise where you get to bring that brand back to your hometown. Imagine if you could have been the first franchisee in your area with Orange Theory Fitness or Massage Envy, right? So these are brands that once the world woke up and everybody wanted one, including all the members who were going there, they saw the gold mine that it was, then they were like, well, how do I get, you know, how do I get one? But they were all sold out. And this is where then those franchise owners, if they were astute or smart enough, raised their hand and said, well, supply and demand, there's no more available. You can pay me a six multiple of what I built and I'll happily go away. And so you have those pioneering trends when those trends, those brands go on to become, you know, the the next big brand in America. For somebody else, that may be way too risky. You may feel more content investing in a business that's like Supercuts or Great Clips, right? These, they're they're like Titanic, (laughs) the Titanic, you know, they're just, they're slow and steady, never going to have a real high, never probably going to have a real low. And they're backed by massive massive um, company, big corporate America. Some people who are trying to run away from corporate America don't want anything to do with that. They want the more pioneering, nimble company where the founder of the organization gives you his or her personal cell phone number. And then other people that somewhere in the middle or all the way to the extreme of, you know, big corporate America, because that makes them feel safe. So my job is to get to know people, to understand you personally, professionally, and financially, and to talk about these things that you might not even consider important. Um, oftentimes, if people come to me having looked at franchises for six months or a year, and they maybe it's a husband and wife, and they couldn't agree on the right one, in one conversation, I can ask certain questions and see where they are misaligned. And then I can know in like 30 minutes why in a year they couldn't come to the same place and agree on one brand. That, and that's my expertise. That's what I do. So is there, um, so is there a difference? Like, uh, like what's the price range? Because I I've heard, and it's probably even more now, but like a McDonald's franchise is over a million dollars if you can get one. And, but like a subway might be 150. Is it, what's the range? Is it even bigger than that? Is there something less than a hundred and something like $10 million? What's the, the range on, on franchises these days? Okay, so there's a wide range, but it's a total myth that the more proven the franchise, the bigger the investment. McDonald's would be a bigger investment over a subway, surely by because of the size of the restaurant operation and all of the high the tech the the uh, high tech equipment that's running in a McDonald's versus a subway. So it's a total myth that the bigger the brand, the more money you have to pay to the franchisor. Good. There's no correlation there. I have brand new pioneering brands that enter with a sixty five thousand dollar franchise fee. So that's, that's just the franchise fee really goes toward the cost of recruiting a good franchisee. And that's a $50,000 is about the cost of recruiting you a good franchisee. So anyway, the range of investment um, could be in franchising could be as low as 10 or 20,000 to as high as three, four, 5 million. I mean, if you're investing in a climate controlled self storage, which to me is like the epitome of all businesses, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is like a gold mine just sitting there, cha-ching, cha-ching, and the owner never steps foot in it. Um, but those are like $5 million to build, you know? So again, this is why I have a business. I teach every single candidate that I work with. And one of the first conversations we have, I teach people what your money buys. So I'm going to be able to correlate for you the time commitment. This, the primary skill set required by the owner to drive a success in a particular kind of business, where the business would physically operate from, so like home or a retail 
location and then wrap all of those in a financial bow. So I help people. It's one of the, again, like one of the first conversations I have, because the number one reason people look at franchising and then don't say yes, is they figure out they can't afford it. So years ago, I figured out that if I could help people figure out that they can't afford it sooner rather than later, then they would take themselves out. But not just saying, hey, you don't have enough money, you know, sorry, but like educating people Mm -hmm. so they can call me back because like I'm, I'm getting ready to help a guy who about two years ago, we went through this, you know, what your money buys. And he was almost there, like dangerously close, but for the kind of business that he really wanted to operate with the skills that he thought he would enjoy waking up and using, he needed about another 50 to a hundred thousand dollars. So he went and invested some money in cryptocurrency. It made so much money for him this past year. He came back and he had the money and he said, I'm ready to go. So I, this is why I take the time. I always tell people, if you're intrigued by this conversation, do not take yourself out of it because you think you can't afford it. Like, give me the opportunity to educate you so that you can go save your money, do what you need to do and come back when the time is right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great time for you to tell people what your website is or how they, they reach out to you. Okay. So my website is the daily coach. That's my last name, D A L Y the daily coach.com. Also uh, starting this year, I've been, I'm endeavoring to build a YouTube channel. Um, that's very, very content rich, all kinds of juicy conversations and myth busting videos. I'm <laughs> um, just like the good news. I mean, there were so many amazing stories in 2020, like stories that defy the mass media that defy logic. Even one of my favorite fitness franchisors opened 250 stores during 2020. Wow. And they sold another 300 locations. Like people, who were those people that were investing in fitness during a pandemic when they couldn't even physically be open? Right. So my YouTube channel is really endeavoring to build like the good news and franchising, like I said, myth busting and just trying to get really the, the right information out to people. Like the biggest thing when you buy a franchise, you're not buying a brand, you're buying a relationship. You're going into business for yourself, but not by yourself. The most important thing you can do is find people who inspire you. Find a group of people that have a culture where you feel you can thrive. You can grow professionally and you can grow personally and financially because success in your business is not just going to be financial. That's one correlation to happiness, but it's not the only one, right? Finding people that you, that motivate you, that push you, finding an organization that has a vision that you completely buy into and you can't wait to say, hey, pick me to, to take your brand back to my hometown and go make something of it. That is the most important thing that we're doing and why widgets go to the side when I start the process of working with people and we focus more on what you want to wake up and do every day. And who are the people that I'm connecting you to? Because those are the two most important things in my 19 year history of franchise consulting that lead to success and happiness. Because those yeah. are like the same thing in <laughs> franchising. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. So it's not just coming and looking at numbers of ROI. Well, which one's going to, for this amount of money, which one's going to give me the best return or any of those kind of metrics that they do. It's really about the corporate culture and the, and the philosophy behind it, the people that started the franchise. And a, a little bit about how, is there a difference in the way certain franchisors work with their franchisees and what they provide and or what they require? Like you have to buy all of my toilet paper. You can't buy anybody else's toilet paper. You know, is there, talk a little bit about how that works for a corporate culture and, and picking that out. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There are different types of franchisors, as we've already mentioned. Excuse me. There's small mom and pop organizations, right? Companies that are just starting that maybe have 10 or 20 franchise owners. And then there are big conglomerates that have multiple, like um, there's a parent organization called First Service Brands. And First Service Brands is the parent franchisor to California Closets, the giant in the closet industry, Serta Pro Painters, the largest painting organization in North America, Floor Covering International, 
Paul Davis Restoration Services. I mean, Paul Davis has franchisees that do 20, 30 million dollars a year in water mitigation, you know, and pillar to post home inspection. So they have all of these brands under their parent organization. So when they bring a new brand to market, it's a very different pioneering scenario than a mom and pop operation where, you know, somebody had a good idea, decided to franchise their business and off they go. In fact, this year at this time in my you know, where I am in my growth in franchising, I really don't lead people to the small little mom and pop operations, not too often, uh, mainly because if there's no expertise on their leadership team that that has built a franchise before and understands um, the not just the uh, physical infrastructure that has to be built, but I'm the emotional infrastructure that has to be built. Look, when you're when you are a franchisor and you're working with people who are investing their life savings, most for most people, you know, they're taking their money from their 401k through the Robs program, which is a way to do it without creating a taxable event. And they're investing that in this franchise. And money makes us all emotional. Money makes people crazy sometimes, right? Yeah. And so they're investing their life savings in you and in your vision and your brand. And there is a huge emotional component to this process, which is why when people come at the process and they're purely analytical, like I get the numbers have to be right or nothing else is really going to matter. But it's not all about the numbers, because here's the thing. When people come into this investigation and they're purely focused on getting that pro forma right and validating with franchise owners to see what other people are making, I'm like, that's a dangerous place to be. Because what you're saying is, this is the best analogy, because I think this whole thing is like a a courtship leading to a marriage. So what I say is basically you're looking your partner in the eye and saying, I'm going to marry you. But if you don't look exactly like you look like if you for the next 30 years, if you don't look like you look today, I'm not going to love you anymore. That's what you're saying. You you're taking one moment in time from that business and validating numbers as if this is like a permanent situation. A business is a dynamic thing. And you are the biggest factor or variable in your success. So you're trying to validate a business taking you out of it. Because we we can have the best system in the world, right? The most proven processes, the best marketing that gets to faltering, a franchisor that answers that phone to the, your initial question about the level of support, right? So they 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 get the mark the phone to ring for you. They answer the phone, so it's all systematic and consistent. They take the customer's credit card. Still no guarantee that you're not going to fail, right? And ultimately. It's still your business to make or break, no matter how much the franchisor does for you. So when people are getting down into the weeds of those numbers, for me, it's a very, very dangerous scenario to get to. This is not a bit like you're not looking at a prospectus of a stock because you've got to factor in you. Right. So when you find people in the system that validate a story that resonates with you. Yeah. And breaks those people and be like, Hey, can I be your new best friend? You know, but if you hear people that are struggling or not making the kind of money that you want to make, it doesn't mean this isn't the right investment for you, or you can't go out and make all the kind of money you want to make. It just means that they're not making that kind of money that you want to make. That's all it means. Well, you know? there's all, yeah, a lot of it comes in. Not so it's worth ethic, but also location and things like that. Did the franchisor help you with that, or is it really up to the franchisees to say, "I, I want to put this down the street for me," versus you know, ten miles in a different market? So different franchisors provide varying levels of support on finding the right real estate or, um, you know, constructing your store, the very best ones, the ones I work with, they do not expect a first time business owner to go negotiate a lease with it, like a landlord, like they're doing that. They're working with you to, with using, you know, demographic and psychographic data to score a location. We're not like, oh, this looks like a good location. Like there's a lot of science that goes into where we're going to place a location If the franchisor is awarding you a service territory, like if you're going to own a residential cleaning company or, you know, a gutter company, the the types of businesses I really love. You you asked me before and I didn't actually answer the question, but I love the dirty, unsexy businesses that, you know, are like recession resistant, needs based, low fixed cost, allow you to start from home with smaller investments and scale as you go. 
there's just a lot of business to be made in some of these kind of obscure businesses that people would never think of without someone like Kim Daly. If you go to my website and you read my testimonials, like over and over and over, people are like, I never would have found this business. You know, I just interviewed a franchisee who worked for Paramount Pictures in California. I know I keep changing the subject, but these are like, as it's going, it's good stuff. And she works for Paramount Pictures and now she's driving a minivan selling flooring, you know? And we were laughing. I was like, come on, it's that minivan that got you out of corporate America, you know? But she's laughing at herself now, but it's the characteristics of the business you know, the low fixed cost, the, the parent organization, the, you know, um, the product that's needs-based and want-based, a high ticket item. Like there were certain characteristics that she and I identified that felt good for her. And then I matched the business to that. And, and she's having a blast. She's having a blast. So I got off of your original question, but, um, the level of support, where were we? The level of support will vary from franchise to franchise. I think where I got off was when when you when a franchisor is defining a territory, look, they're not trying to sell you a lemon territory. Like who does that benefit? You know? So they're if if they award you a territory that doesn't work, like you're just going to be a thorn in their side for the entire time that you own that business, right? So this is where you have to sort of have faith in the relationship and why when you invest in a franchise, you're buying people first to really validate with other franchise owners and build that relationship to where you trust their leadership and guidance. But at the end of the day, Karen, I'll tell you this, brands, locations, territories, business plans do not make owners successful. What makes an owner successful? The owner. Yeah. <laughs> well, These are all support tools that can make it easier or maybe a little bit more challenging you know, can get you out of the gate faster. But ultimately, just like when I was a personal trainer in the gym, I could have the best equipment. I could have the most up-to-date, you know, science, technology, biometric, whatever, physiology to like help people do the most effective exercise for a body part. But I couldn't do the work for them, right? I could lead them to it, but I couldn't do it for them. I couldn't control what they did in the 23 hours they weren't with me in the gym, right? So the same thing with a franchise, the franchisor is like the personal trainer. They can have the best plan in the world with the best proven toolbox, but it's what you do with the toolbox that will determine your level of success. So we know the plan works. The question is, are you going to work the plan and how well are you going to work the plan? Excellent. Yeah. And I think that is actually a very consistent with how investors look at deals that they're investing in that you know may or may not be a franchise kind of a thing, but when they're as an angel investor, the ones that are really successful always look for the team first. I was listening, I was watching a, a podcast with a venture capitalist and he was talking about, you know, because products and plans change to fit the competition and fit the marketplace and the shifts in the yeah. dynamics. But if you've got good people, then they will be able to figure out how to navigate that and do what they have to do to be successful with whatever the business is. And that's really exactly. kind of what you're talking about. It's exactly what I'm saying. And last year, 2020 was the absolute best year to explore a franchise just for that reason, because anybody can make a business look good when times are good, but it took unprecedented leadership and adaptation to overcome and to keep doors open, to get doors back open. And more importantly, that emotional leadership, right? The strength of the franchisor, their, their spirit of abundance and confidence that they could convey and portray to their franchisees to keep these people from getting into the fetal position and just staying there like yeah. a deer in headlights, right? It, it, it took a lot. And so last year was the best year because it was black and white, which companies really had leadership that was there for their franchisees. My fitness franchisor that I love to work with, one of the largest fitness franchisors in the world, personally like was calling every, they have 1700 doors open across eight or nine brands not one of their franchisees paid rent. Instead of furloughing their support staff, they staffed up. They were like, our people are going to need us now more than ever. Like it's these kinds of, this kind of validation that you want to hear, right? Right. I have all kinds of 
check out my videos. Seriously, I have home services franchise, fitness franchisor, a few different franchisors that I've already interviewed about how they adapted and overcame and what happened in their industry during uh, 2020. And it is all good news. It's all good news at the Daily Coach. <laughs> yeah. So the YouTube channel is also the Daily Coach. It is. Yeah. Okay. So for those that are listening and it's down in the show notes, but it's daily is D-A-L-Y. Okay. No I in there, like the daily of a week. <laughs> so it's just daily. Right. So the daily D-A-L-Y coach.com and look for that also on YouTube. So as we start to like uh, come full circle, full circle on this, the um, one of the things that sometimes seems to be a strategy where somebody maybe because a lot of executives, they get a golden parachute, there's something they want to get out of, but, you know, they really don't want to work nine to five. Is it still a, a marketplace for investors to be the financial arm, but then find a, like an owner operator to run it and then eventually buy that investor out? Kind of, Does that still work? Is that, or is that just a myth that those kind of things happen for entrepreneurs and investors to the entrepreneur that can't afford to buy one or pay, spend all the money gets a cosigner on the bank and puts the money in whatever, you know, that kind of a combination like that, or is it pretty okay. much all active investors investors need to be active in their own investment of a franchise? Ooh, no, 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 no. We have varying levels of owner, um, owner operation, You're like the number of okay. hours you, you want to put into your business. So we call it semi-absentee ownership all the way to almost absentee, but a business is never going to be right. absentee. It's never going to be purely turnkey, right? It requires that owner. But I mean, what a way to go into the second half of your career or to retire from your big corporate job and take all the things that you've been doing for other people to make other people rich and to put it into your own future. You, you mentioned the book, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the cash flow quadrant. These, these books are exactly what we're talking about, right? Because you're building that asset. 90% of millionaires own their own business, right? A business creates cash flow that you own and control, provides tax shelters, right? So you, not about how much money you make, it's about how much you get to keep, That's right. right? And, and, and then, you know, in, if you're part of a franchise where, the brand is continuing to build. There's that exit value, the exit strategy to consider. You know, I, I interviewed a franchisor that said that, you know, most of his franchise owners um, made their biggest hit on an upon exit. They, they had seven figure exits from the business. And so there's also that part, you know, someone wants to pay you a million bucks or 2 million bucks, some multiple of what you built to go away, you know, and at 65, you decide to go hang it up. Or maybe you're building a legacy for your kids. So you have multiple locations, you leave one to each one, or, you know, you have one of your kids running it as the day-to-day -day learning business, but you get to be the mentor, um, kind of the CEO over, you know, working on it while your, your children work in it, or you hire somebody. So there are varying levels. Yes. The answer is yes to that. Um, and that is something I work with upfront with people to understand their work-life balance goals. Where do they want to start? You know, what's funny is a lot of people want to be that owner, but when it really comes down to it, they don't trust that they can start as that owner, which I right. understand. I mean, again, you're putting the majority of your life savings in who's going to watch it more closely than you. Right. And it's much easier to train employees and support employees if you have more knowledge of the business, because most of the franchisees coming in that I help have no previous experience in that line of industry. Right. Right. So a lot of owners will say, you know, I'll, I'll work in that business or want to put more time into it for maybe the first six months to a year, but then I want to be able to step back. So we talk about that and then I match the different opportunities to that investor. We have things that are like almost purely hands off, like a laundromat. There are laundromats that are franchises, you know, so that's a big construction play. Um, getting it open, you have a very small team of people, maybe one to four people, um, but probably less than five hours a week time commitment by the owner, even from day one. Yeah. There's just so many things out there. I think you can think of Really, when you come down to it, just about every business out there, 
that you see as a mom and pop down the street that you might, there's probably a franchise version of that someplace that you could be a part of if you always, if you, whatever you wish. Oh, I, w- I wonder what it would be like to run this kind of business someday or do this kind of thing. Or even when it comes to restaurant concepts, it's like, oh, I want to, I want to have a restaurant that does such and such and such and such. There's probably a franchise out there. And and for those, everybody that's listening, if that's you know- one though, Karen, not to interrupt you, but there probably is one out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And- who do they call? They call Kim Daly, uh, you know, to figure out how, when, why, how do you go about doing that? When's a good time for you to do that? What do you got to do to prepare so you're ready? Like if you are thinking, oh, I'm retiring in three years, I'm retiring in some number of years and I want, to, I'm not ready to sit on a rocking chair on my front porch. And, you know, I love the beach and golf, but I can only do that so many days a week then, uh, you know, ha- go to the dailycoach.com, check out this stuff, check out the videos. And I say, you know, schedule some time with Kim so that you can be on a track that says, this is what I, um, this is what I want to do. And you know what all your options are, because, you know, w- one of the programs we have is uh, within what I do as the, you know, uh, compassionate capitalist movement and angel investing is this thing called an exec with a check, right? So an exec with a check is somebody that invests in a startup business, takes an active role in that business, and then works some way out of a job. They don't take a salary because their money's going into building the business. Well, that's really great. And you can have some really great upside potential, but for all those that are not, don't have the stomach fortitude of the true startups and all the unknowns, figure out a way to do, take that same money and put it into, into a proven business concept that has the resources that you need to be able to grow and succeed. And you just have to put your own business acumen, your own knowledge and hard work. And, and, and if you don't know it, you hire somebody to help you figure it out and go about doing it. I think it's a really great thing for people to be thinking about, you know, they, I, I joke that, um, they say, you know, entrepreneurism is the new black, right? It's the new midlife crisis. Oh, I know. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Well, don't start from scratch. Build it, sell it, buy it, whatever, you know, go in and buy and work on that. I think that's the really great way to go. And I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, um, you know, sharing your insights. Anything else you'd like to add that we didn't cover that you were hoping to talk about? So great. I love that. (laughs) And you're right. I mean, you can leverage. Why go out and reinvent the wheel? If you can find a system with people and you can come in and you just get to be focused on your day to day operation and turning your investment into something that's great for you, but not have to like drive the future of the organization, you know, and for and for some people that they're not they're too entrepreneurial for that. They want to be more focused on driving. And that doesn't mean you're not driving your own vision in your own backyard, going into multiple territories or, you know, hiring different levels of leadership to take yourself out. It doesn't mean that at all. Look, there are franchise owners and that own 95 stores. That's a major corporation at that point, right? Right, so right. So you can, you can come in and be a single unit operator or a multi-unit operator, an area developer, all different levels. So it doesn't mean there's no vision. You need a vision, absolutely. But what I'm saying is that you can rely on you know, who's watching the competition and who's looking for new vendors and who's trying to adapt and overcome during COVID. But you just get to stay focused on your little world and live your little life. Like I always say, entrepreneurs love to invent and we need entrepreneurs or we would never have franchises, right? So I'm not saying anything against entrepreneurship. Franchisees, franchisees love what a business affords, which is money and quality of life right? You should be able to leverage the systems to ramp your business faster, to get to the making money part faster. An entrepreneur may spend three to five years toiling to try to figure out the business plan and perfect it. In that same three to five years, I can take an executive owner who wants to own multiple locations and he or she can own three to five locations in that same three to five years. So when we talk about building wealth in a franchise, that's how it, that's what I'm talking about. The wealth is created through the scale. The scale can happen faster because the infrastructure, the marketing, the technology, the systems are already proven from day one. So you're not stopping to create them. You're just taking them, getting trained on them, and then off you go to execute and replicate. Very good. Very good. All right. So thanks again for coming on the show. 
And uh, really uh, appreciate appreciate all the information. I want to encourage folks to share this podcast or this YouTube video with somebody that you know that's thinking about buying a franchise or thinking about retiring soon. You know, thinking about becoming an investor. And you know, my whole thing about promoting compassionate capitalism is put investing into entrepreneurs as an asset class in your portfolio like you do real estate and stock and investing in a franchise is investing in entrepreneurism so it is the type of asset that is does not have you are in control of how far it goes and how far how much value it creates real estate and stocks are oftentimes outside of your control there are always black swan events that happen, like we did recently experience, but in general, you get to control a lot more of your destiny when it comes to being an entrepreneur or investing in an entrepreneur, or in this case, investing in a franchise. So awesome, Karen. I love being on your show. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And thank you, everybody. Onwards and upwards, please visit karenrands.co to learn more about all that I do as well.